Welcome to the Zen Stoic Path. I have a very special guest here with me today. I have Sal, the hair philosopher, who is one of my dear friends and clients. Sal is in Austin this weekend, so I got to have him come into the studio to share his wisdom with the listeners on the Zen Stoic Path. Sal, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, I'm really man. happy to be here. Yeah, man, I'm super excited. I was, I've been waiting for this for, for several weeks now, so I'm pumped. Too, yeah. <laughs> <Me too. laughs> Excellent. So I know you're, you're here in Austin because you were actually doing some teaching. So uh, if you wouldn't mind, if you could tell a little bit about what you do when it comes to hair, when it comes to the actual teaching style and what you were doing here in Austin this weekend. You got it. Well, I do this thing called a hair tour. Um, and so I go around different cities that I, I, I want to experience, check out. And so I come see clients and as well as like different formats of teaching. So sometimes I do in, in you know, uh, group teachings and times like today I do what's called a shadow education. So I have professionals that are either new or older to the game, kind of see how I work and what I do. Um, and it's really fun. I mean, I have a, have a, have a great time. Yes. <laughs> That's amazing, man. Yeah, I know uh, you have a really interesting style when it comes to hair, not just in how you actually cut people's hair and style it, but the way that you think about the whole process, which I found fascinating. And I know, you know, before you even decide to cut anybody's hair, you usually have a conversation with them and kind of see where they're at. So can you talk a little bit about your process and what kinds of things you're discussing and thinking about with that person? Got it. I mean, there's a, I like to tell people that there's a lot of lenses that I use mm -hmm. to look at people. You know, I'm a big curious person. I love culture. I love I love humans. Mm -hmm. um, I love getting to know them and trying to understand them. Yes. You know, I was really interested in psychology and sociology. I, I'm a big just person watcher, you know. So mm -hmm. through all my different learnings and skills, like uh, fashion, uh, even like soccer and boxing have influenced uh, how I do hair, you know, yes. <laughs> I love history. I thought of being a, a history professor. I love archaeology. Mm -hmm. I love anything that's exploring. Yes. Especially exploring the mind. So when it comes to hair, I'm not just looking at, at uh, how I can make this person look better because of the hair, mm -hmm. but it goes deep. You know, I like to say that I have like a, what do you call it? Like a tool belt. Yes. And, and in it, I have a lot of lenses. Almost like how a, if you go get your prescription taken you know like the, they, they ask you if uh, is one better or two better and you just kind of keep choosing so mm -hmm. i feel like i do that have my little lenses and i kind of look at the individual in my chair through the multiple lenses and, and i'm able to get a better understanding of who they are and and give them a haircut or a hairstyle that matches what's going on on the inside mm. you know i like to say that i'm like a translator yes the people come already knowing uh what they want but they don't know how to express it you know they're shy to share that with you if it's things like i want to feel sexy or i want to feel cool i want to mm -hmm. feel badass i want to feel empowered it's so hard for a lot of people to express that mm. so it's my job to get in there and, and really bring that out of them and and i think it's, it comes down to manifestation you know yes i want them to help manifest for themselves the person that they ambition to be mm -hmm. but it's it's it's, I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, dude, I, I can see you light up when whenever you talk about it. And I found it fascinating because I remember the example that you gave me is if somebody comes in and they're wanting a haircut because it's trendy mm -hmm. and like they come in, they're like, I want bangs. <laughs> and you're like, well, hold on, let's talk for a second. <laughs> so how do you make that determination when somebody's coming in and what they're asking for? Or I guess like, how do you even express that to them that what they're asking for doesn't really match what you're picking up mm. from their energy. Mm. It's, I mean, it's a series of things. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like through the years I've gotten better with my read of people. Yes. Uh, it's highly intuitively. It's, mm -hmm. I always say that it's intuition and imagination. Mm. You know, so I almost like put myself more into like, um, whenever I take myself too serious doing it, mm -hmm. then things don't quite fall the right way per se. Mm. You know, it's almost more like I make it harder. But if I make it more playful, more like a child, yes, like I allow myself to be like a child and, and do like really like silly questions or like really mm. curious questions, the client go like, oh, I've never been asked those kinds of things. I invite them to match what I'm giving them, which is also play 
You know, yes. Be, be like a child. Be imaginative. You know, us as adults, we get very complicated and we make things really hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the same goes for my clients and the people that I teach. You know, mm-hmm. I, I try to simplify things um, and make it very fun. Like I said, yeah. very, very playful. Yeah, so and, and it should be a playful process, yeah. right? Like, why not? Why not have fun when yes. you're, you're doing something like this, right? Yeah, I, I really like that because I know you and I, we talked about this at length, you know, a few times, but the, you know, when we bring it back to Zen Stoic philosophy, that whole distinction between performance and sincerity. And it sounds like when people are in there with an intention of performance, like they're not being themselves, they're not expressing themselves, or they're not asking for something that's going to help express them. Exactly you're able to bring that sincerity by bringing that like childlike playfulness to the conversation and then even practice the intention of understanding rather than control and like taking yourself too seriously. Oh my goodness, totally. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Because I've been there as well. You know, mm-hmm. like I've, I mean, I've done this this year, 20 years now. And 20 it's, years. It's, it's shifted. Wow, man. Yeah. <laughs> it's shifted through the years. Yes. You know, like, like I think I was telling you, like I'm, I'm constantly looking for more depth. Yes. You know, like, the drive wasn't always the same. Mm-hmm. I feel like it's it's a matter of years that have allowed me to become more like this, mm-hmm. like a philosopher per se. Yes. Um, but at points it was more like, I want to be really cool and I want to be like a rock star and look at all the fancy things that I can do with my hands. And mm-hmm. It was more like showmanship. You know? Yes. A lot of it was driven by fame and, and success and what I thought it had to be. And now it turns more about creating more depth mm-hmm. and, and for me, honestly, for me, not to get bored. <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent. Expanding what what the meaning of what I do is, and and it it has to be something that really connects deeper with the human. Yes, the person in my chair, the person around me, and my own self. Beautiful. I like that. That's uh, yeah, that's, that's very Zen Stoic of you. <laughs> We're all about Thank connecting you. with the person, <laughs> so it's perfect for this podcast. Look at us. <laughs> Look at us. <laughs> So I, the, I want to touch on something that you said there that I think is really profound. You were I'm saying, I am. yes, what, what? I mean, we're going to revisit that in just a moment, <laughs> but, Thanks, man. but the part um, where you're talking about not wanting to get bored and then your way of not getting bored is actually going into depth, which that is fascinating to me because it's actually the same way that I do it. Mm. But what I've noticed in talking to a lot of people is that's not the default to go to when you feel bored. Most people, when they feel bored, they go for range. They go for more variety and they try to go wider. Where have you found depth to be a good uh, avenue for when you feel bored or when you need to explore something new? Where have I found depth Mm -hmm. to be? To be a better avenue for you when, whenever you feel like you might get Uh, bored or you're getting, you're feeling stale. I think, I think it comes down to freaking being a child. And then, I mean, Unlike other children looking for the meaning of life, you know, like I'm, I'm fascinated by that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. wondering the possibilities of human evolution and consciousness and life in other worlds. And, mm. and I think I had to <laughs> look for that here and, and yeah. on earth, you know what I mean? Uh, and it's basically exploration of deepening mm-hmm. that is the drive itself. Um, what was I going to say with that? Um, deepening. Oh, yeah. So when it comes to like meaning of life, you know, mm-hmm. like what I keep finding is that the meaning of life is the li- the meaning that you want to give it. Yes. So I keep revisiting what that is constantly. Mm-hmm. And, and like I told you earlier, like it, through the years it has shifted. Yes. Like hair for me at the beginning from age seven to four. No, seven. From 14 to 21. <laughs> like I was in second grade, just cutting <laughs> people's hair. <laughs> I was 13. So from 14 to 21, it was all about money. Yeah. Air for me was not my passion. It was not what I wanted to do for the long run. It was just a means to an end, which was money. Mm-hmm. 21 comes around. I decide to do hair for, for a living so it can buy money and fame. Mm-hmm. 28 comes around. That's when I opened the salon, married my wife. Uh, mm-hmm. She became pregnant. And, and so it, all of a sudden, I started wondering more into uh, legacy. You know, what am I going to mm-hmm. leave behind? So... The meaning of life for me has gone deeper and deeper. Yes. And I will continue to do that. And, and so the journey itself is what keeps me going. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's interesting because as you developed as a person, every iteration of you 
asking that same question, right? Going deeper into the question, it's almost like the answer shifts because the person asking it is now different. Yes. Right. You being yes. a different person and like your purpose was originally money. Then it became, you know, like money and fame and then now it's legacy. So the purpose shifts with each phase of life. That's why yes. I always find that whole thing on I'll oh, find your life purpose in a lot of these advertisements when it comes to coaching is like, it's kind of silly. Like it gets, people it, to, silly. it gets people to obsess about something thinking that it's stagnant, that you yes. have to find yes. it and it's this treasure, but it's not stagnant. It's, it's moving with you and you've had the ability to experience that, which is really, really cool. I was just thinking of that yesterday and kind of expanding on it, like, mm -hmm. you know, meditating after my, my Austin trip and seeing my clients and interacting with multiple people. It was that of like, Oh my goodness. If I had, think of this before it's mm. obviously a different person asking for the outcome mm. but now i'm a different person <laughs> yes asking a different question and and, and that's what i it, that gave me a lot of peace to be honest mm -hmm. because kind of like how you're saying you know a lot of a lot of us get caught up on like this is what it is and i'm going to find it mm -hmm. once you find it you don't find the the joy in it anymore yes because you're a different person right it doesn't even matter anymore yeah that that's a that's a beautiful way of putting it it's it's one of those truths that, that exists in Zen that gets talked about a lot, how like everything is always changing, right? The truth of impermanence. Yes. And it's like when you originally set out to find the thing that you thought was stagnant, by the time you get there, <laughs> the world has changed and you have changed. Exactly. So it's a totally different experience of when you actually get there than when you had originally asked it. Exactly. Yeah, which is the whole point of staying in the process, right? Being present. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like what happened to the Buddha, right? He started to see realizing that there were people out there getting older getting mm -hmm. sick and that people were going to die yeah otherwise he probably would have still thought that he was going to be forever mm -hmm. you know, emperor and it's only when he realized that there was time and time had an effect on us humans that he wanted to search for the depth of what life itself was yeah i love i do love that story of the buddha what what originally like what was your introduction into that story mm -hmm. and how did it affect you good question Oh, dude, well, I mean, I've always been like, oh, my God, I, I, I love all religions and I hate all religions because I see mm -hmm. the... I all think the of same it, time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like pieces of the puzzle of truth. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's only a piece. Mm -hmm. But it was right around the time my, my son was born. My son was about to be a year. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe he had had a child. Mm -hmm. And uh, seeing the growth of the child was like, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. like he wanted to check out. Yeah, went on out there, so it was kind of like I was like, "Oh my god, it's like I'm having the Buddha experience." Right yeah, I'm now, having the know? Buddha experience right now myself. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, the, the birth of my child was definitely a, a very impactful. Excellent. Yeah how does um how does your philosophy on life and your pursuit of consciousness? Because I know that that's a journey that you're on, especially in not just your craft, but also personally. How has that influenced the way that you parent? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy <laughs> it's um it's, he's a he's a little mirror you know? mm -hmm. he's a little mirror it's, it's fascinating because i used to venture out on really deepening myself and like going to the desert for a few days or mm -hmm. trying different medicines or fasting different methodologies to like get me there mm -hmm. and he's born and i'm changing a diaper i'm walking to throw the diaper away and all of a sudden, I have one of the most profound revelations, you know. So it's wild because the most mundane things and the most mundane interactions with my child trigger just as an impactful reaction that mm -hmm. any of these searches have <laughs> not even given me, you know. Yeah. So it does, man. It does impact you profoundly. That's amazing. What, what was the revelation in that moment exactly? Oh, oh well, that's just uh, like a general uh, thing. But... Uh, I think one of the first times that I was really tripping out on throwing a diaper was thinking, you know, like, maybe what if my whole life I've driven it, the drive has been to, for me, mm. me, me being here on earth because of me, uh, it's my soul journey, but what if it's not even about that, what if it's about passing that on mm. to him, you know, so for the first moment in my life, I thought my life was maybe not for me. You know, what Interesting. if it's prepping me, thinking me that it's for me, but it's not. I don't know how I feel about it any, 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 at this point, mm -hmm. honestly. 
But at that moment, it was very, I had never thought of my life that way. Right. Yeah. It's like you had to think of the world and life itself outside of your own yes. subjective perspective. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. Which, I, which I can imagine can be like both beautiful and disorienting at the same time. Totally. Like, totally. <laughs> when, when he was born, uh, um, well, right before he was born, I was thinking, because we really wanted to have him. You know? mm-hmm. and I was thinking, is this a selfish or a selfless act? Mm. And I kept going back in that question to myself, yes is this a selfless or selfish act because we wanted to have him so bad mm-hmm. but also it was in a way giving ourselves up for him right but not until he was born it was like oh my god what if my mm. life is not for me but for the passing on of life mm. yes yeah and expanding that whole view of yourself yeah. Yeah. that's really interesting I, I was wondering what are your feelings or views on the paradoxes of life or living in the paradox. Like what if things are sometimes both selfish and selfless? How do you see that, you know, coming up in, in your own life? <laughs> I feel like it's a continuous one. Yeah. Comes up. Um, I mean, we, we talked about it a lot. Yeah. You know? <laughs> we certainly have <laughs> at length. <laughs> and, and you and I described it as the, the hippie and the rock star. Yes. Like the hippie wants to just let life happen and, and go mm. with the flow. Mm-hmm. And the rock star wants to take action and yeah, make it happen. Be the flow. <laughs> That's right. Be the flow. <laughs> um, so it keeps coming up for me. You know, like one of the great um, things I, I learned uh, with you was was they don't have to be against each other. They're mm. part of the same. And and I think it's just different versions of ourselves and and, and of myself, and I have to use them. Yes. Whenever they're they're needed. It's almost like the lenses that we're talking about. That's right. And, and there's so much that we were talking earlier about multiverse, right? There's so many versions of that's ourselves right. that want to come in and play. Mm. So I think that's where it, being like a child and having the imagination, mm-hmm. it's really impactful. That's right. It makes you realize I am everything. Yeah. I'm not just this one thing, you know? And I think like seasons, seasons really help me to understand that. Seasons? Yeah, like the the path of nature, you know, like you have summer, spring, winter, like, so same with us, like the closer we are with nature and the, the seasons, we can also learn to not be attached to, oh, I'm just this right now. Mm. I am multiple things, and those come and go, and then maybe we'll show back up, and and I think it's, I think it's really a cool opportunity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, that will help us understand more the the process of life and death. Yes. Just like dying and living, but letting go of ideas, giving birth to new ideas, letting go of seasons of ourselves. That's why I love hair, because it's like, well, time for a new hairstyle, you know. Yeah, it's, new it's season. Seasons. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's, that's a... That's a a big one for me, the season. That's a that's a really cool way to look at it in seasons, right? Because uh, I think just sometimes telling people everything changes, everything is impermanent, can feel, you know, depending on your level of understanding of this stuff, can feel very disheartening and yes. overwhelming to think like, oh, I'm never going to have that again, that experience or those feelings again because it's all impermanent. And then, it's a loss. Right, it's a loss. And this could be like an extreme point of view or an extreme uh, framework to, to be thinking from. But I think if you describe it in the way that you did in seasons, it's like, no, there's, there's a flow to this and there are different seasons to you, to life, to your life purpose, to the people in your life and how you interact with them. That is a much more digestible way of viewing it. Yeah. I find than just being like, everything changes. Deal with it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> exactly. It's gone. Yeah. So that that that's a really cool. I'm 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 stealing that. I'm gonna have to use that <laughs> for, for people. <laughs> yeah. I will be taking. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for contributing that <laughs> on the podcast here. So the um the people that introduced me to you, which are the uh, the Lopez siblings, you know, just out yeah, there in LA, friends. yeah, doing their <laughs> thing. I I know I'm going to be having one of them on the podcast uh, at some Sweet. point soon, and I'll be on that's theirs. Fun. Yeah, so shout out to uh, Super Mama's podcast. Yeah, <laughs> that's shout uh, out to them. That's what they got. Um, but they, you know, they were telling me about you before you and I met, and like how they've known you for a very long time, <laughs> and how you started. It's and it's crazy to see the the evolution of your career, but how you started cutting hair. 
in the garage. Yes. Yeah, like like Steve Jobs. <laughs> 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 Started in the in the garage. So what was I mean, what was that experience like? Like what originally inspired you? I know it was money, but of all things that you could have done to make money, why hair? Um, it was really easy. Mm-hmm. Um when I came to the States, uh, I was born in Mexico and I left there when I was thirteen and, and mm. haircutting was a big part of my own life and my well what do you call it? Uh, well-being, mm-hmm. you're so, you're so, yeah, yeah, like uh, feeling good about myself. In Mexico, um, I used to get haircuts maybe like every two to three weeks. My parents would take me, and uh, they were completely unexpensive. Mm-hmm. And and it was part of like my reward, you know. I had good grades, you get a haircut. You know, I was a I was a nerd. I was a smart ass, and I loved it. <laughs> Academic competitions, I was like top of my class, and, and and the whole thing was like, yeah, keep getting good grades, you keep getting haircuts. Yes, and so I was. I love my hairstylist. I never went to a barbershop. It was always women taking mm. care of me, and mm-hmm. being really sweet to me. And mm-hmm. my later um, hairstylist was a single mom, and she was, I, was, I had a big crush on her. Mm-hmm. She was so loving, so kind. She really saw me, you know what I mean? She saw me mm-hmm. uh, and, and made me feel seen. Yes. And so when I came to the States, uh, I was 13, going through so many hormonal changes. I didn't know the language. I hated my parents, and and... At the world and America for, you know, for, for taking it all away, everything mm. that I knew, you know, so it was really hard. So not having my haircut and not having my feel good moment really bummed me out. Mm. You know, I felt, I felt really, uh, alone and unseen. Mm-hmm. So my parents go, don't, don't worry about it. Just keep getting good grades. We'll take you to get a haircut. So then I visit a barbershop and that's when I experienced a whole next, you know, <laughs> I was just another next, mm. you know. And it only made me feel more sad and depressed than I was really feeling. So I said, screw this. If anyone's going to even going to make me feel this way, I'd rather be me. So yes. I picked up scissors and clippers and I went into my bathroom, cut my own hair. And How'd that first one go? Oh, man. I, I must have been in there for two hours in the bathroom. <laughs> just, just like every detail. Oh, boy. <laughs> it was bad. It was bad. But I said, you know what? It's going to be better in two weeks. My hair grew really fast. I used to have it really short like you. Yeah. And so, again, two weeks later, try it again. And it kept getting better and better. So, you know, I'm in high school at the time. I'm 14, 15. And kids started seeing my haircuts. And I'm at the time, I'm, like, drawing stuff in my head, you know, I'm getting really, really good. Mm-hmm. Cutting my family, cutting little friends. And people started asking me, who cut your hair? Can you mm-hmm. cut my hair? And I'm thinking, no, you sneaky teenager. I'm not going to cut your hair. <laughs> sweaty, no. <laughs> so, again, I didn't think of it. as like, oh, this is what I do. Mm-hmm. But I value education really highly, and I wanted to, you know, we could only afford um, public school at the time. Mm-hmm. So the classes that I was interested on, on were at the community college. Mm-hmm. So I said, well, this could be a little business venture. If mm-hmm. I make a little money, I can pay my own school. Mm-hmm. Uh, so while in high school, I was taking classes at the community college for psychology, sociology, philosophy, painting, sculpting, yoga, mm-hmm. you know, and all the things that I really wanted to geek out on. Yes. And so that was a drive, you know. So I had started having like a better relationship with hair of, okay, it makes me, it's a means to an end. It makes me money. I pay for my schooling. And then I get to explore the world and see what I want to do. And sure enough, I had all these teenagers in my, my chair. You know, I got really involved in, in, in anything that I could. You know, I love mm. mentoring people. You know, yes. I thought of being a psychotherapist or a psychologist or a professor, like a history professor. So uh, I grew up Catholic in Mexico, so soon we looked for a church, and I got involved in the youth group. So you're having me like speaking and coaching, mentoring the, the younger teens that were completely depressed. Like it was like during the whole emo mm-hmm. era, you know. And also, like I was really good in soccer. I was captain varsity. Mm-hmm. I came back and coached the soccer team in high school. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm coaching, also mentor. You know, part of like a, a group and and the high school that kind of like pushes minorities yeah. and, and to try to go to college. Mm-hmm. You know, so I was part of that co- uh, mentoring and like uh, everything, like history, even English, ironically, mm. uh, math. <laughs> and so I'm doing all these things for, for the, the teens, mm-hmm. you know, like the people around me and, and, and I'm having to kind of have more of an impact on people. And, and I'm realizing like, Oh my God, like, it's more than just making money on a couple of bucks. Like I'm actually getting to impact people in my chair, mm-hmm. in my garage. So soon after I start working at the local barbershop 
and this is where things really start taking off you know like mm-hmm. i start kind of like outgrowing the the main guy and i'm starting mm-hmm. seeing this stuff like maybe a possibility for me to venture yes. out and what started happening that really set the tone was that there was magic in the chair you know mm. it wasn't all about making them feel good or making them look good it started going deeper you know it was a coaching it was a psychology uh, I was really into fashion too, so I, I actually graduated and went to fashion uh, school at the community college. Oh, that's so cool! <laughs> uh, so You're like, like I gotta complete the look. Yeah, it's yeah, not yeah, just yeah. the hair. <laughs> yeah. like pattern making, tailoring, draping. So another lens, you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. all of a sudden, I'm starting to like see hair deeper and deeper. But people in the chair, when they come to you, and they were coming to me at the time, you know, they wanted a transformation. They're ready mm-hmm. to come in, bringing themselves to surrender you know it wasn't like my one-on-one practices in psychology of like oh tell me about what's happening Mm -hmm. like why do i need to tell you you're 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 a teen you don't know anything yeah the chair is different you know people already come in oh yeah i'm gonna give up something Mm. i'm gonna cut my hair off or i'm gonna do something to my hair Mm -hmm. so i feel like that helps let go the idea of letting go the idea of change so that was it man I started seeing like, holy cow, like in the chair, in the hair chair, mm-hmm. more transformations and, and deeper, even like fashion statements and deeper, everything else is happening rather than all these other ventures. So that's when I realized that I was 21. Uh, screw everything else I was trying out. I'm mm-hmm. going to do, I'm going to do hair, but I'm going to give it more depth. That's beautiful. That's you, you hit on something that I think is so key and i don't even know if you knew you were doing it but i think when i say it now it may click for you and i'm very curious to hear your perspective on this principle so one thing that i talk about in coaching as well as in zen stoic a lot is this principle of being the source of what you seek to experience Mm. so you had this source of being seen and feeling safe and feeling really cared for when you were in Mexico every time you would go and get a haircut. Mm, And suddenly that was taken away from you because you came here. So like one of the things you cherish most in your life was suddenly inaccessible. And so for a while you tried to find it, you tried to find it. And then finally you're like, screw this. I'm going to be the source of that. And you weren't just the source of it for yourself by cutting your own hair, but you started to become the source of it for everyone around you. And then that turned into different forms like coaching and sports and mentoring and (laughs) talking to them and having them in the chair. And suddenly you became the source of the very thing that you thought you had lost. And that to me is one of the most empowering principles that a human being can think of is instead of just like begging or longing for the source of the thing that you seek, become that not just for yourself, but for other people. And it magnifies the whole experience of it. Yeah. Man. Yeah. I mean, I, that thought has come yeah. in there. It's, it's cool seeing you reflect that back to me. Cause that's, I mean, that's essentially what you do too. <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> and I think we recognize that in each other, you know, exactly. And it's cool, man. It's, mm-hmm. it's cool. Like sitting with it and, and like admitting mm-hmm. to yourself that that has, that is the path. And it's, so it is, you know? <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's a really beautiful thing. I think that, at least that that was what it was for me, yeah. right? In like going this path of doing coaching as well as, um, I, I never like to say it this way, but like being a philosopher <laughs> it makes me feel so weird when I say it like that. <laughs> like I'm taking myself super seriously. <laughs> um, and obviously you've gotten to know me. I don't, don't take myself seriously at all. <laughs> Most of the oh, time yeah. <laughs> I like to be silly it's and playful guy, as well. Yeah. yeah. But, um, I mean, a lot of that was just wanting to become the person that I wish I had as a kid, yeah. like to, to give me advice and stuff like that. Like a lot of people helped me out and gave me advice growing up, but I'm sure you had this experience as well where it felt as though a lot of the advice that you're getting or the coaching that you're getting was fragmented. Like it was good, but it wasn't the whole piece. It was just pieces, pieces of, of the puzzle. puzle. That's right. <laughs> pieces of the puzzle, right? Just like the the world's religions. So, yes. you know, wanting to unify that and bring it all together and realize it's all part of the same message, I think is a really meaningful pursuit. Yeah. I think that's hence the desire for exploration, right? It's like mm-hmm. wanting to see what's out there but everything that's out there it's already in you yes <laughs> you're just interpreting 
mm-hmm. what that is and, and what, how that fulfills you. Yes. And a lot of, I like to say a lot of my teachers, and I have so many teachers, like from the people I met on the street to actual teachers, you know, a lot of the times I learned from what not to do. It wasn't mm. so much the, yeah, this is what you do. It was a lot of the what not to do. Yes. Know? And I think that's very valuable as well. And finding what really you take from that, and and, and we're, we're essentially we're again, you know, we pass it on. We we are a product of what was. Mm. You know, it continues to be. Yes, that, that's a great point. The uh, how there are a lot of teachers out there that are also what not to do. Yeah, because that contrast gives you so much. Like because you whether it's the pain that you feel from it or the stress that you underwent by learning what not to do. That's so great that you're like, no, it can't be this way. (laughs) I need to figure out (laughs) what the right way is to do it. And and what's really interesting is like a lot of, a lot of my, I guess, coaching and schooling in business Mm -hmm. was, I think a lot of that, like I had a lot of coaches and mentors on my way, you know, to buildings and stoic that it seems like when I look back on it, there was some really great advice on what to do, but there was so much of what not to do mm-hmm. simultaneously. And it's part of what pushed me to build the the business in the way that I had, right? To ask myself the question, how would the business need to look if it was completely based on referral? Mm-hmm. And I knew I needed to do it in a super genuine way in order to create that. And that actually came from having coaches that I was like, this is not how you do this. <laughs> like, I don't know what the right way is, but this, this isn't is it. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. And it, you know, it drove me to, to, to want to figure that out. So. Pushes you and it forces you to find that out for yourself. That's right. Yeah. It, it's, it, I think it's really cool. That idea of looking at the world as a classroom and how there are so many teachers, like just random people you meet in the street. Sometimes somebody you've only known for like an hour and never talked to them again, could be yes. a very profound teacher for you. Uh, it's almost like the external world is a reflection back to you Mm -hmm. and whatever it triggers emotionally is a point of dialogue. Like I was talking with a a friend yesterday and she was telling me how her sister does tarot card reading. Uh And I typically like, I'm not into tarot cards or anything like that or astrology. Uh But what I do find interesting is that when you read like a horoscope, or when you, if somebody does like a tarot card reading, not to take it as like, this is my destiny mm-hmm. or like, this is my life now, because to me, that's not really necessarily a responsible way of, of looking at it. But I think where there is value in stuff like that, like tremendous value is when you listen to this stuff, whatever kind of sparks you emotionally or triggers you emotionally, whether in a positive or a negative way those things are almost like reflections of the outside environment that are signaling you to have a dialogue with yourself about that, right? To have a conversation, whether it's with you or with somebody that you trust to be like, Hey, what is it about that? That made me feel this way. What is it about that? That made me feel happier. What is that about that? That scared the shit out of me. And I think that's where there can be some really constructive conversations you know, leaning more on like the stoic side of like, okay, how can I reason and rationalize through this thing that has grabbed me emotionally? So I always find stuff like that are are really interesting and how the outside world could be like a mirror pointing right back at you, teach you so much. I love that you were open to, 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 to that, you know, and then like see where it let you, like you're talking about it now. Yeah. You know, it's leading on, I think it goes back to imagination, Mm -hmm. right? Like you, Opening up to that, it opened up the door for imagination and perhaps the the I'll do or the I won't do. That's right. right. But it, it it gets the mind going and and I think I th- I talk about it in my classes. Uh, I, mm-hmm. I think you and I talked about it like storytelling. Yes, the importance in storytelling, right? Like you have a child and the child only read one book growing up. The child will see the reality only from the point of view of that book, right? So say like it's Red Riding Hood. He's going to think there's only wolves and there's only Red Riding Hoods, Mm -hmm. right? And I think the importance of storytelling comes in into like passing on different stories so that you have a wider imagination and wider range of things to pull from to see for yourself as well. And and that's why I love talking to everyone and anyone and the people that I meet in my chair because they open the doors for me Mm -hmm. to either take or leave what I want to go with. But mind journey, you know. That's right. Yeah. No, stories are such a great way of teaching. Only it, because 
it's the way that we learn when we don't realize we're learning yeah. and we're like suspending disbelief when we're looking at stories. And so I think part of having a playful mindset mm -hmm. just for life in general is learning how to view things more symbolically rather than always literally. Yes, exactly. Like, yeah, maybe this thing doesn't mean something specific to my life, but what does it remind me of? Mm -hmm. You know, how, what, 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 what does that spark within me? And there I think go. stories do that really, really well, yeah. you know, like, and so telling them in the chair, yeah. it, it went a place where somebody's just, you know, relax and <laughs> they're like, Oh, I'm just here to get Story my hair time. done. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out we're going to change your whole life right now. <laughs> uh, are you ready? Or what? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's amazing. So, I know um, something that, you know, we, we talked about a little bit in the beginning was, you know, you're doing the hair tour, you're doing a lot more teaching. Um, if, you know, somebody's listening to this and they want to learn more about that, like where can they access that or how can they find out more about the hair tour? Got it. Um, so I have a salon um, called Nova Art Salon. Mm -hmm. And so you guys can go to my website, mm -hmm. novaartsalon.com, uh, and it shows you all the different kinds of philology we have for teaching. Um, We'll be developing soon um, online classes as well. Oh, beautiful. I'm um, starting to work on a book where I will be talking about philosophy and the deeper aspects of it. Yes. It might be, have to be a few books because there's a lot. There's a lot to be I could imagine about. a series. <laughs> yeah. uh, but this year, 2022, the second half of the year, I will be uh, continuing to tour. Mm -hmm. I will be taking the classes to different cities. Beautiful. Some of the bigger cities. Uh, but if you're interested, if anyone's out there interested and wants to have me in the Shalon under space, uh, please reach out. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I've been loving the more personal classes as well for like small towns. That's yeah. been really, that's been really rewarding. I think at the point in my, in my life, like I said, it's legacy. So I just want to touch as many people and meet as many people as I can and, and mm -hmm. one head of hair at a time. Beautiful. So if somebody is, you know, looking to to take a class with you, what's the type of thing that they can expect from this experience? Like, what? Well, I mean, I guess it feels like anybody can go and learn, you yes. know, new techniques right. for for hair. But it sounds like yours is quite different. Like it yeah. hits on a different level. It's not just techniques, but there's like a whole way of like thinking and feeling through the process. Yeah. Well, I mean, now that you said process, like it's been a process for me. Yeah. Developing like how I teach and what i'm here to teach mm -hmm. so i know i mean i already have ideas of what that will be you know there's there's ideas for like an academy as well and mm -hmm. like not so much like i love teaching techniques mm -hmm. but that i feel like so many people out there do great hair already you know again what i want to do is deepen i think i know what i've it's made me a better artist with what i do is is deepening mm -hmm. so i would almost want to do like even like retreats or, or ways to like connect everything else you know just like the physical emotional mm -hmm. uh, all of it um and I, I i like that you asked that because the first thing i tell people weren't I'm teaching them either if it's one-on-one -on -one format or a small group or a big group i said what do you guys want out of this class and i said careful what you what you're asking i'm not asking for expectations of the class mm. what do you want from it mm. so i can make sure that i can give it to you you know so i invite people to same with my clients, like, mm -hmm. what do you want? I ask, I invite the, the individuals taking the classes to really say what they want. And it varies, you know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just like, well, I just want to learn how you cut this piece or I want to learn how you talk to the client, you know. Like, mm -hmm. it's evolving. Yes. It's definitely evolving. Absolutely. But I really make it about what they, what they want out of it. Very interesting. Yeah, it, and what's interesting is the questions that they ask sometimes people don't realize that the, the very questions that they're asking are to them maybe feel like they're surface level. Like, Oh, I just want to learn this technique. But mm -hmm. really when you start to dig deeper and you start to really talk to them about it, it <laughs> sounds like it's like a similar process of like somebody comes in and like, I want this hairstyle. They're like, okay, okay. let's talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it sounds like the, yes. the way the whole class evolves is, you know, really, Oh, people don't even realize that it's it's like hitting them at a much yes. deeper level the variable is always people yeah you know? like i'm there to provide but the variable is them and what they really want and i my whole goal is to like empower them to speak up and, and ask for that yes you know? most definitely so before we wrap up i have one final question that i like usually like to ask my guests um that i always find to be an interesting one and I, I purposely make sure people are not prepared for this question because I want to oh, hear the on-the-spot answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, but I remember one of my uh, old clients, he came on my podcast and he asked me this. And I was like, you know, stumped for a second. But he basically said, let's imagine it's like thousands, tens of thousands of years from now and humans are no longer here on this planet. Oh, boy. But some alien species comes and they find this note and it has one principle or message on it from you. What would that be? That's, that's a beautiful question, man. We're all part of the same puzzle. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I like that. All part of the same puzzle. Yeah. Beautiful. All right, Sal. Well, I appreciate you being here on the Zen Stoic Path. Um, where can people find you if you could give your website and uh, you know best way to contact Call you one me more time? At, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can find me on, on social media, Instagram, uh, Sal Sal Hair. Mm -hmm. My website, NobleArtSalon dot com, and that will give you more of a thorough. Let, let you know where I'm at, what I'm doing. Amazing, amazing, Sal. Thank you so much for being thank on the show, so man. Much, Appreciate it. Really happy to be here. Likewise. Thank you. Good job. Nice, man. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing.